But in 49 BC, even though he knew it was an act of treason, and even though he knew it was an act of war that would be punishable by death, a fellow by the name of Julius Caesar, remember that name? Julius Caesar uh, decided that he was going to he was going to march his army toward the city of Rome. And so when he came to the Rubicon, when he came to the Rubicon, according to Suetonius, who was a Roman historian in those days, when he came to the Rubicon, Caesar made this statement. He said, the die is cast. The die is cast. As a result, there was a civil war that lasted for some five years. And when it was over in 45 BC, Julius Caesar, uh, because he had been victorious, uh, he never was punished uh, for his illegal invasion, and he became the ruler over the entire Roman Empire. Now, the reason why I tell you that little bit of history is because the phrase crossing the Rubicon, it's a phrase that is now used, as one writer has noted, to refer to an irreversible commitment. It's an irreversible commitment to a grave or to a serious course of action. Or, or as we would say, uh, more simply, it is simply coming to the point of no return. There, there's no turning back. Uh, we, we've come to a point of no return. However, the truth is, in this, in this day and age, uh, sadly, such commitment is seldom seen. Such commitment is seldom, is seldom seen. In fact, it seems the word commitment has basically become a lost word in the vocabulary of many modern relationships. Uh, that, that's why in business, a con signed and sometimes broken before the ink dries. Uh, no commitment, no commitment. Uh, marriages, uh, couples these days many times enter into marriage and they already have an escape clause in place. It's called a prenuptial agreement. And, and there's already an escape clause. They're planning for divorce before they even get married. And uh, no commitment, no commitment. Uh, churches. Churches have the same problem. We're, we're not immune to this. Churches have the same problem. A, a person is, is quote unquote faithful as long as something more important doesn't come along. You know, I wonder how God feels about that, by the way. Uh, he'll probably ask about that when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. But, but there, no commitment, no commitment. And so it's certainly no surprise that there is also a lack of commitment when it comes to this thing of personal relationships. Uh, in this Facebook age, uh, people have, oh, I've got, I've got 47,000 friends. Uh, my wife is one of those. Uh, she's friends, she's friends with half the earth's population, you know. But, but when you get right down to it, how much commitment is really in those friendships? I mean, think about it. How much real commitment, how much real commitment is there? Very few are willing to make a commitment in this day and age. Very few are willing to make a commitment, a solid commitment with other people that will last a lifetime. Very, very few, very few. Now we began this study a couple of weeks ago, you'll remember, by considering the words of the Lord Jesus. Uh, remember in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus made this statement in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 16. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And you remember we noted how that if our light is going to shine effectively to point sinners to our Savior, and if our light is going to encourage saints in the pathway of holiness, then there are some connection points. There are some connection points that are vitally important, connection points that need to be carefully maintained. You remember we saw there is, first of all, the upward connection. There's the upward connection. This has to do with our personal relationship with that, with that friend that we call the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, aren't you glad he's your friend? 
Uh, boy, I sure am. And, and what a wonderful friend and a faithful friend that he is. And so, but that, that relationship, that upward connection, that needs to be maintained. And we maintain that by keeping our lives clean and, and pure and walking in obedience to his will for our life. The upward connection. Then there's the, there's the inward connection. And that's, that's understanding who we are understanding who we are and understanding what we are as believers in Jesus Christ. And so, and so there's, that, there's that upward connection, inward connection, and then there's the outward connection. And that's our relationship with other people, the way we connect with other people. And, and it's here, using the Apostle Paul's relationship with Philemon, that we have, we've been focusing our study. And we've, we've seen the importance so far of three things. We've seen the importance of, of godly encouragement, uh, using, using words that will encourage and edify and build up other people. Uh, we've talked about godly cooperation, that is, building relationships that are mutually beneficial on a spiritual on a spiritual level. And, and then we talked about godly forgiving, uh, refusing refusing to hold refusing to hold grudges. Well, now the apostle Paul is going to show how that if our light is going to shine, effectively pointing sinners to the Savior, encouraging saints to walk in the pathway of holiness, there must be be a godly commitment. There has to be a loyal commitment in our relationships with others. Now you'll remember the story how that Philemon was a businessman in Colossae. He had been won to Christ by the Apostle Paul. He had a wonderful testimony as a man who loved God. He loved the saints, had a wonderful testimony. But, but Philemon, you remember, had been deeply offended when his servant Onesimus had stolen some money and had run away, run away to, to Rome. And, and we've seen how that while Onesimus was there in Rome, uh, there was a divine appointment that God graciously made for him. And God in his sovereignty orchestrated the circumstances in Onesimus's life where that he actually brought Onesimus into contact with the Apostle Paul. And as a result of that, Onesimus himself was also wonderfully, wonderfully saved. And so therefore, the Apostle Paul now found himself kind of caught in the middle. He, he's, caught between, he's caught between Onesimus and he's caught between Philemon. He's caught in the middle, which created, of course, a natural tension in his commitment. There was a natural tension in his commitment to Onesimus, who's a, he's a new brother in Christ, who, who had been a blessing, been a help to him on the one hand. On the other hand, there's Philemon, a faithful brother in Christ, who was an old and a trusted friend. And so the Apostle Paul is going to show us, he's going to show us four things. He's going to show us four things here that, that will be seen when a person has a godly commitment in his relationships with others. Whether, whether it's on one side or the other, there are four evidences that will be seen that will show that there is a godly commitment to the relationship. And so let's begin by the first one. Uh, when there is a godly relationship, it will require, first of all, being open. It's going to require being open. One writer has noted this, one of the signal characteristics of loyal friendships which endure over the years is the element of transparency. <clears throat> Excuse me. Without openness, our relationships can never get past a superficial level. Without openness, they'll never get past a superficial level. But this thing of, this thing of being open, this thing of being transparent with others, it, it, it's not easy for most people, and it's extremely difficult for some. And I'm one of them, okay? I'm one of them. I, confession is good for the soul, right, Brother David? And Yeah, okay. So I'm going to confess my wife's sin. No, I'm... <laughs> confession is good for the soul. I am, by nature, a hardcore introvert. Now, you, you may not know that, and you will understand why in a few minutes. But, but by nature, 
I, I, I am a hardcore introvert. My, my natural tendency, my default setting is to keep people at an arm's length. I, I don't let people get close to me. I, I, I just, I, I never have done that. My, my, my default setting is to keep my thoughts to myself, to keep my feelings to myself. And, and I just default. I don't let people get too close to me. I, I, I never do that. Give you an example. When Ginger and I were in Bible college together, we had just gotten married. We attended High Street Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri. It was a large church. They ran 2,000 plus every Sunday. And so, and so we, we, we attended that church. And, and so we always sat. Uh, I, I kind of like to sit in the front, and Ginger likes to sit in the back. So we sat right behind the last row of the deaf section, which was at the front of the church. Okay. So that's kind of where we were. And there was another couple there that many of you will remember, Bill and Georgia Ecton. You remember them? They came here and, and filled in for a while uh, while we were uh, in the States when uh, Pat, they worked with Pastor Moore and all of that. And so, so when we went in uh, to the church, we go up, we, we take the seat right behind the deaf section, and, and right in front of us, sitting on the last row of the deaf section, was Bill and Georgia Acton. And they were sitting there because they wanted to learn the deaf sign language. And so, so they're sitting there. So, so we go in, we sat down. Very first Sunday, uh, it had to happen. Uh, Georgia Acton turns around, and you know Ginger, immediately, boy, they're just, you know, they're, they're best friends in like two minutes. And, uh, and, and so <laughs> they started talking, and, and it was like that every Sunday. And uh, me being me, I just kind of nodded from time to time. Never really took part in the conversations. And yet in spite of, in spite of me, okay, in spite of me, uh, the Actons became uh, very good friends. We actually ended up working together in Korea and, and, uh, and have maintained the friendship uh, through the years. But, but years later, uh, we were visiting with the and Georgia actually confided in me. And she said, you know, when we were to together there in High Street, I, I told Bill, my husband, I told Bill, she, she, said, she said, you know, every time I speak to Ray, I always look him straight in the face and I speak very clearly and distinctly because he reads lips better than any deaf person I ever met. Now that's a true story. That's a true story. Bottom line, I, I was the kind of person that instead of building bridges for relationships, I'm the kind of person I build barriers, and, and, and I understand that. Pe people sometimes ask, how in the world, how in the world did you and Ginger ever get married? Well, that's easy. She talks, I listen, it's okay, you know? <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, that, that's kind of how it, but, but seriously, seriously, I will ever be thankful to her because she has really helped drag me kicking and screaming out of my shell to be the wonderful, happy person that I am tonight, okay? And, 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 and the truth of the matter is, truth of the matter is, I'll, I'll, I'll confess to you, I still struggle with this. I, I still struggle with it. Uh, even now, I, I literally have to force myself. If I don't know a person, I have to force myself to, to open up, talk to them, uh, create a, some kind of relationship with them, because that's, that's just the way, that's the way I am. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that you ought to go out and tell your whole life story to everybody you meet. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that at all. Everyone has their right to their privacy. Everyone has their right to their privacy. We all have things in our lives that we, we do not want shared simply because they're personal. Or, or maybe they're embarrassing. Maybe they're even shameful. And, and we don't want those things shared. But, but this openness I'm talking about, it, it's not about revealing to anyone and everyone all of the little nitty gritty details of our life. Rather, it's a willingness to have an openness 
that will build bridges to connect with others and create a personal relationship that will then open doors for ministry. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. And that's what we find in our text. So let's notice two things real quick. First of all, there's the Onesimus Bridge. The Onesimus Bridge. Now, I cannot be dogmatic here because the Bible is not dogmatic. But let me tell you what I believe. I believe the Apostle Paul actually opened up when he met Onesimus. I believe he opened up, created a bridge. He opened up by sharing his own testimony with Onesimus. In, in other words, he honestly, openly told Onesimus how that be, before I trusted Christ as my Savior, I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. Before Christ saved me and changed my life, I, I used to chase Christians. I imprisoned Christians. I, I even killed Christians. That was who I was before I trusted Christ. But then on the Damascus Highway, Acts chapter 9, you can read about it, I had a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus Christ, and he totally changed my life. And after that, after that, I totally dedicated my life to serving the very same people that I once persecuted. I, I, I have devoted my life to ministering to the people that I once chased and hounded and, and sought to destroy. And, and it was as a, res, as a result of, of building that bridge, building that bridge with Onesimus. Onesimus was, he was convinced and, and he was determined. If the Apostle Paul can do that, then I can go back to Philemon and I can acknowledge my wrong and I can make things right with him as, as I should and as the Apostle Paul is instructing me to do. I can go back. I can be a loyal and a faithful servant to him that I ought to be as a child of God. That, that was the Onesimus, the Onesimus bridge. Now, like I said, I can't prove that from the Scripture. But I just can't help but believe that's what happened. But let me show you one I can prove from the Scripture, and that's the Philemon Bridge. The Philemon Bridge. The building of this bridge began when the Apostle Paul uh, opened up uh, chapter 1, verse number 1 of the book of Philemon. When the Apostle Paul opened up and said that he considered Philemon to be a beloved fellow laborer. He's opening up to Philemon, and, and, and now it continues as the Apostle Paul again opens up and, and tells Philemon that, that how the, the relationship, that, that it's based on the relationship, and because of this relationship that they have, there is an expectation. And, and he tells the expectation in verse number, verse number 17. Here's what he said. If thou count me a partner... In other words, if you, if I'm, I'm the Apostle Paul, and, and, and if you count me, if you count me as a co-laborer in the ministry, and, and if you consider me as a brother in Christ, and, and if you hold me as a real, true, personal friend, then notice what he says. Receive him, Onesimus. Receive him as myself. Receive him as myself. Bottom line. The Apostle Paul shows his commitment. He's open. He's honest with both Onesimus and with Philemon. We, we have this friendship, but there's a, there's a responsibility that you need, to, you need to consider. And so it's the openness. The openness shows his commitment by being open. Not only does he show his commitment by being open, uh, let's move on, shows his commitment by being obligated. Shows his commitment by being obligated. The Apostle Paul had showed that he was committed to Onesimus when he obligated himself to write this letter. He's writing a letter to, to Philemon. He's, he's preparing a cover letter so that Onesimus will be able to, to return and, and to make things right. And so, and so Paul had showed that he was committed to Onesimus as he wrote this letter seeking a reconciliation. And, and, and he did it. Understand this. The apostle Paul did this knowing full well that it could blow up in his face. It, it could, it could not go well. And yet he was committed. 
to Onesimus. And, and so he wrote the letter. And for that reason, the Apostle Paul wants to make it clear that he's also committed, he's also committed to Philemon. And, and I want you to notice how that he acknowledges or he obligates himself in two ways. First of all, by acknowledging the wrong. By acknowledging the wrong. It seems from the wording of the text, it seems from the way this is written, that Onesimus had confessed to the Apostle Paul that he had been dishonest in his dealings with Philemon. In fact, that's the why the Apostle Paul had said to Philemon back in verse number 11. Uh, the Apostle Paul said concerning Onesimus that in time past, uh, he was unprofitable. He, he was an unprofitable servant in time past. But, but the Apostle Paul wanted to make it clear that he's not asking Philemon to simply suck it up and pretend that it never happened. He, he's not asking Philemon to do that, and he wants Philemon to understand that. And so therefore he acknowledged the wrong of Onesimus. He acknowledges the wrong. But, but then the Apostle Paul shows his godly commitment to both Onesimus and Philemon in that not only did he acknowledge the wrong, but he also assumed the debt. He assumed the debt. Verse number 18, an amazing verse. Many sermons have been preached on this and, and using it to show a beautiful picture of what our friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, has done for us. But, but here's what it says, verse number 18. If he hath wronged thee, if he's stolen from you, or if he oweth thee aught, uh, in other words, if he has stolen from you by borrowing money that he has not repaid to you, then 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 I want you to notice here uh, from this wording, kind of seems like Onesimus had told him, I, I wasn't really dishonest, but he didn't give all the details. And, and so the Apostle Paul does not, is this an absolute theft or is it a borrowing of money that has never been repaid. He, he, he's not sure how it goes, but he knew that Philemon would know, right? He knew Philemon would know, and, and so he was, he was being open and sharing uh, with his friend, Philemon, that he is now willing to assume whatever it is, he's willing to assume that debt. In fact, verse 18 and 19, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, Put that on my account. Put it on my account. And, and, and then notice what he says. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. That's kind of like signing the promissory note, right? Kind of like signing the promissory note. He personally obligated himself the debt that o, uh, uh, of Onesimus, the debt of Onesimus would be satisfied and the wrong to Philemon would be rectified. It would be rectified. So the Apostle Paul showed his commitment by being open, showed his commitment by being obligated. Number three, he showed his commitment by being objective. Showed his commitment by being objective. The Apostle Paul knew that when two people have a godly commitment to their relationship, it will never be a one-sided relationship. Did you get that? When, when, we have, when we have a godly commitment to our relationships, the relationships will never be one-sided. They'll never be one-sided. In fact, because of how his ministry had been a source of blessing to the people of Galatia, you, you remember for an example, uh, the Apostle Paul had noted he ministered to them, but it wasn't just a one-sided thing. It wasn't just a one-sided thing. Galatians 4.15, I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Uh, this verse tends to support the idea that the thorn in the flesh, the apostle Paul prayed three times and asked God to take away uh, that thorn in the flesh was an eye problem. And, and, and the people in Galatia knew he had an eye problem. And because they loved him and they appreciated so much his ministry and the way he had helped them and ministered to them, they, they were willing to pluck out their eyes and, and give them to the Apostle Paul. Had that been a possibility, they were willing They were willing to do that. That's the same kind of idea we find now with Philemon. Notice it in, in verse Philemon 119. The Apostle Paul says, Albeit 
I do not say to thee that thou owest unto me thine own self besides. In other words, the Apostle Paul here is gently reminding Philemon that you're indebted to me. It's a gentle reminder. You're indebted to me. You've been saved by the grace of God because I was willing to obey the call of God on my life. You, you've become a Christian because I was willing to leave my home country as a missionary. Uh, you, you've, been, you've been brought into the household of faith because I was willing to come to Colossae and, and to establish a church and, and, and introduce you to Jesus Christ. You, you, you sort of owe me. You sort of owe me. But the Apostle Paul would not use those things as leverage. You know, a lot of times somebody owes us and we, we don't let them forget, right? We, we kind of hold it over their head from now till Jesus comes and, and we use it as leverage to try to muscle them and force them and coerce them to do what we want them to do. But, but Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't do that. Rather, the apostle Paul understood that a godly commitment in relationships must be voluntary if it is going to be effective. And it must be voluntary if it's going to be Christ-honoring. It has to be a voluntary thing. And so here's what he says in verse number 20. He says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Let me have joy of thee in the Lord. R refresh my bowels in the Lord. What, what, what's he saying there? He's simply saying, Philemon, I want you to encourage my heart by doing what you know God, by the prompting of his Holy Spirit, wants you to do. This is my advice. But you have to make the choice. And I want you to rejoice my heart. I want you to fill my heart with rejoicing as you do what God would have you to do. So the Apostle Paul, he showed his commitment by being open, showed his commitment by being obligated, showed his commitment by, by, by being objective. And then there's a, a last one, very quickly. He, he showed his commitment by being optimistic. He showed his commitment by being optimistic. And so because of his godly commitment to Philemon and Philemon's godly commitment to the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is optimistic that Philemon is going to respond in the right way. Onesimus has already committed himself. He's going to go back. He's going to, he's going to try to make things right with Philemon. And, and, and now the Apostle Paul is encouraging Philemon how he is to respond to that, how he is to accept that, how that he is to receive Onesimus as a, as a brother in Christ, uh, just as Onesimus had received the admonition to make things right with Philemon. And so, and so the Apostle Paul, as he writes this, he, he has a very optimistic attitude. In fact, here's what he says in verse number 21. Having confidence, absolutely confident, absolutely confident in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee knowing. Yeah, as I write this letter, I already know how it's going to come out. I, here's what I know. Here's what I know. I have confidence knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Not only are you going to accept Philemon or accept Onesimus as a, as a brother, you're going to accept him in the same way you would accept me, but, but, but Philemon, I know you. I know you. You're going to do even more than that. You're going to do even more than that. Because of the Apostle Paul's godly commitment, to both Philemon and Onesimus, as Brother Jason hinted earlier, they are reconciled. They are reconciled. In fact, there are various traditions. The Bible is silent on this, but there are various traditions in some of the older writings which claim that Philemon eventually became the pastor of the church in Colossae and Onesimus became the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Because these two men were willing to do what was right in their relationships with one another, to acknowledge the wrongs that had been done and to accept the apologies that were given. 
God was able to use both of them in a very wonderful way. Now, again, those are traditions. Whether they're true or not, I really cannot say. And even the scholars are divided. But what I can say with all confidence is this. When we have a godly commitment to the people who are around us, when we have a godly commitment to those who are around us, God will use the light of our testimony. He'll use the light of our life to draw sinners to our Savior and, and to help to encourage Christians in the pathway of holiness. And, and so my prayer is that in this age of cheap friendship, which really means nothing, that we will be serious in this matter of building real relationships with people, building solid relationships that are committed to helping and encouraging one another in their walk with God. That's what we need as we let our light shine. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would take these thoughts and apply them in each heart and in each life. And, and Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand just how important it is that we, that we have the kind of relationships with other people, uh, not so that we might use them or take advantage of them or, or, or any such thing as that, but Lord, that we might seek to build relationships that we, might, that we might be a blessing and a help as we minister to them and encourage them and, and, and try to help them in their walk with God. And Lord, I pray that you would help us understand that these kinds of things cannot be coerced they cannot be forced. They cannot be dictated. Every person has the right to their own choice. But Lord, help us to be such an encouragement and such a help for others that, that people will be encouraged to do right, motivated to do right as they, as they are around us and, and our, our lives are able to, to influence them. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.